Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Now, more than 5 billion people lack access to justice. Inequality has been skyrocketing. More than half a million people die from violence every year. Half of the world's children and at least a third of women are victims of violence. That was before the pandemic. We all expect the situation to deteriorate. The pandemic was and is, first of all, a public health emergency, but then it turned into an economic crisis. And finally, now we see that the socio-political structures are coming under increasing stress in almost every country. We are here to talk about how we can handle this and avoid the worst scenarios. The pandemic made visible the fragilities and flaws existing in our societies the cleavages that exist and that make it impossible for people to heal and help each other. The injustices that make some people more vulnerable than others and some people less able to access help and recover it. The inequalities that make our societies divided and polarized. The breakdown of trust and institutions that make unrest and violence break out. The pandemic exacerbated this existing trends, and we are here to talk about what we need to do to avoid it, tearing apart the fabric of our country's economic, social, and political foundations. The Pathfinders Coalition of 38 countries elaborated a statement about exactly that. It is being launched here today. We will also highlight a similar statement agreed to and endorsed by a broader community of organizations focusing on peace, justice, and inclusion. While the virus is indiscriminatory, we humans and our policies and structures have made the impact discriminatory. And it is up to us as humans, leaders, activists, and politicians to assure that we fix that. That is why we are here today. We must make peace, justice, and inclusion the foundation for our response and recovery. This must be at the center of societal, political, and economic reset, reset after we get this virus under control. And we need to plan for that now. We need to talk about distribution, about how to lower the gap, create more inclusive societies, make the justice system people-centered, how to fight corruption, build trust again, and build bridges in polarized communities that have forgotten how to talk. The pandemic is the biggest challenge we have in generations. It is, however, also an opportunity to drive collective action for peaceful, just, and inclusive societies. We are here to talk about the opportunities, the solutions, the ways forward. And we have some excellent panelists to do exactly that. Now, I am the director of Pathfinders, Liv Teres, and I have the privilege of moderating this event. We will have opening remarks from Her Excellency Marisa Chan Valverde, Deputy Permanent Representative of Costa Rica to the United Nations. We will hear about inspiring country actions on peace, justice, and inclusion from Her Excellency Hasina Safi, Minister of Women's Affairs, Afghanistan. Yasmin Suka, Chair of Commission on Human Rights for South Sudan, former Executive Director for the Foundations for Human Rights in South Africa. His Excellency Magnus Lennartson, Ambas Ambassador and Deputy Permanent Representative of Sweden to the United Nations. We will hear powerful reflections from Lisa John, Secretary General of Civicus, Celia Ouellette, Founder and Chief Executive Responsible Business Initiative for Justice, Nicolas Astier Ibrahim, um, coming from the World Federation of United Nations Associations, Vevin Muganda, Coordinator for Mutual Aid Kenya. And then at the very end, closing statements from a statement from Her Excellency Joka Brandt, the permanent representative of the Netherlands to the United Nations. Now, before I hand it over, 
to my research on Valverde, uh, a few rules of Zoom etiquette. We've asked all panelists to keep comments brief, maximum uh, five minutes in duration. Participants are welcome to add questions and comments in the Zoom chat box. And if time allows, there will be a Q&A at the very end of this session. And with those words, let me hand it over to Marisa Chan Valverde. Marisa, the screen or the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I would like to acknowledge the extraordinary and thorough work of the Pathfinder Secretariat to make this event possible and thank both Director Liv Torres and Her Excellency Joka Brand of the Netherlands for allowing us the honor to deliver these opening remarks in this very important, timely, and needed gathering. I wish to also thank the presence and insights of Her Excellency Hasina Safi, Minister of Women's Affairs of Afghanistan, Her Excellency Maja Fassad, State Secretary of Health and Social Affairs of Sweden, distinguished representative from civil society and organizations and activists. I'm delighted to see so many female panelists today. Dear friends, Costa Rica is proud to co-sponsor this event in a moment where COVID-19 is exposing a human crisis in its multiple, intersecting, and multifaceted dimensions. In this critical juncture, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development remains our common pathways towards a response and recovery with equality and sustainability. Peace, inclusion, and justice must be the engine of our efforts. Their tipping of the SDGs was already a colossal challenge before the pandemic. Socioeconomic inequalities, discrimination, violence, including against women and girls, lack of access to justice, all these gaps existed before and have been exacerbated with the pandemic. Causes and effects of inequalities resonate more than ever in the current context and question us about the type of societies that we have nurtured and the type of society we want. The state action becomes not only urgent, but essential in addressing these gaps for a better recovery and to protect the most vulnerable. This is also reflected in the unprecedented public support for border, national and global action in the edification of a more peaceful, just and inclusive future. In the context of the UN 75th anniversary, 37 countries convened by five founders reaffirmed their commitment to accelerate the implementation of the SDG targets, the 2030 agenda, the multilateral action to address curing global challenges and respond to the demand of our citizens to build a more just, equitable, peaceful and sustainable future. Today, we're pleased to announce the launch of the Pathfinder Statements of Peace, Inclusion and Justice in response to the, of, to the effects of the pandemic. The statement calls for human rights, peace, justice, and inclusion to be the foundation for reset and recovery efforts, to ensure more resilient and just societies and more responsible institutions in the future. To achieve people's peaceful societies, the statement highlights that we might have more knowledge and tools to end violence than ever before, and the commitment to prioritize and scale up concrete and practical solutions to reduce multiple categories of violence by 2030, including violence against children and sexual and gender-based violence. To achieve just societies and resolve the injustice problems created by the pandemic effects, we, make the call to put people at the center of justice. For inclusive societies, we call for a whole of government and whole of society approach where everybody contributes fairly and the cost does not fall disappropriately on those who can least afford it. The statement and knowledge that a new social contract is needed adapted to the future challenges of technological divides and sustainable economic transitions through transparent and accountable political, economic, and social institutions, increased investment in public services and employment opportunities accessible to all and the protection of civil, civic space. Costa Rica was honored to facilitate this process and is committed to HDG 16 goal and pivotal policy areas we believe 
that only intensify global multilateral approach, particularly in the achievement of the SG, SDG 16 plus will catalyze, revitalize and innovative bonds, partnership and actions for a better future. And we put on our own efforts at the service of this shared goal. I would like to conclude by kindly inviting you to the 16 plus forum annual showcase host, um, hosted by Costa Rica with the World Federation of United Nations Associations next year, which will focus on building peaceful societies under the rule of law, inclusion, and transparent and accountable institutions, addressing our own challenges and serving the purpose of enhancing cooperation, exchange of national experiences, good practices, and lessons learned. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Maritza. And thank you so much for the massive contribution to peace, justice, and inclusion that you and Costa Rica represent. Now, let me hand it over to Your Excellency Hasina Safi, Minister of Women's Affairs from Afghanistan. Please, the floor is yours. Uh, I would like to first, uh, on behalf of Afghanistan Women, Women Ministry, uh, thank uh, Pat, Pat Founders, Finders, uh, its partners, and co-organizers uh, for giving me the opportunity to be with you and enjoy uh, the advocacy which we are all together doing uh, from the address of women. So I would like to thank you very much and congratulate you for the initiative. Uh, I believe uh, women are women uh, all over, over the world. We all are facing challenges. Uh, the only difference is with the shape in the format of the challenges. Uh, and to start with, I would like to um, suggest that we can all uh, solve and face the challenges very briefly and very impactfully only by coordination and networking, uh, no matter if we are in Afghanistan, in the United States, in Costa Rica, or wherever in the Netherlands. So we coordinate and we network. Uh, first, I would like to stand in sympathy with the victims of COVID, uh, specifically the women all over the world. And I would also like to uh, share my concerns for the second phase, which is uh, upcoming, in hope we are all planned together in order to um, uh, fight the second phase as well. I think as uh, the women of Afghanistan uh, in the three sectors which uh, we uh, spoke, which is peace, uh, justice, uh, and uh, inclusion, uh, the women of Afghanistan uh, started with a very vulnerable situation. Uh, from awareness, uh, they went to participation and they went to meaningful participation. And I think today they have reached with the struggle uh, and with the coordination which they had uh, in country and out of country uh, by stating that they will not go back uh, to the dark times and they will lead their issues themselves. So uh, this uh, violence against women uh, has been uh, one of the uh, epidemics, not only in Afghanistan, but all over the world. Fortunately, with the efforts which uh, the uh, government of Afghanistan, the international community, and specifically the women partners all over the world has partnered with the women of Afghanistan. And as a result of that, Afghan government has developed many strong policies and laws and strategies which help the women of Afghanistan. So as, as, as a result of that, today, the government of Afghanistan are planning to uh, establish mechanisms in order to get access, get justice to the women of Afghanistan. In practice, the rule of law in Afghanistan. There has been two two very strong laws, which is violence against women law in Afghanistan for women and also anti-harassment law. 
and there are mechanisms where the cases are very much followed. The same thing with the peace process, as some of our international partners are aware that the women of Afghanistan have been a part of the peace process from participation to decision making, which was starting a consultation in a district or decision making at the strategy of peace or high peace council in Afghanistan. And today as well, we are all at different stages and at different levels. We are sitting, we are planning together and we are giving recommendations. And the good thing is that today we have a listener government. His Excellency, the president is a champion of women's rights in Afghanistan. I think during the term, five years term and this term, this will be a historical golden term for the women of Afghanistan, which will be the implementation of laws, the rule of law and the measurement. I think one of the lessons learned which the women of Afghanistan have learned is that we need to be more coordinated. We, mean, we need to assess ourselves all the time, no matter if we are in an urban area or in a rural area. From time to time, we need to assess and then based on that, we plan ahead of how to do, when to do and where to do. About peace, I think, uh, we have been uh, in a very, uh, very uh, supportive uh, uh, platform by the government of Afghanistan, as well as the international community. Uh, I think I would, uh, as, as a woman of Afghanistan, as the minister taking this opportunity, I would like to call on pathfinders, as well as all the members who are partnered here to stand with the women of Afghanistan today in fighting for Islamic Republic of Afghanistan. Because the gains which the women of Afghanistan have got in the last 20 years is because of Islamic Republic. And their basis for that is the constitution of Afghanistan, where they are given equal rights as men, as human rights. Lastly, I would like to touch up on SDGs. I think no matter if it is a local tool, a national tool, a regional tool, or an international tool, the more we coordinate, the more we share experiences, and the more we localize these uh, tools, they will all help all of us, no matter where we are. Because these international tools like SDG, MDG, and like 1325, they are all established or developed for the betterment of the humanity. It is for living in solidarity. It is for living with care. So the more we localize, localize and we, we, the more we give our own definition, the more we, se we see the effectiveness and efficiency of it. So I would like to stop here by thanking again, and I'm at service for any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, Your Excellency, great to hear you talk about equal rights, universality, and the importance of women's rights and the Sustainable Development Goals. I'm going to hand it over to Yasmin Suka. Please, the screen or floor is yours, Yasmin. Thank you so much. Your Excellencies, live and distinguished guests, I would like to take this opportunity to thank the Pathfinders for peaceful, just, and inclusive societies, for convening this timely event, and for inviting me to speak. Our speakers before me have emphasized the COVID pandemic has caused incalculable harm to millions of people across the globe. And if we are to build back better from this crisis, it is imperative that peace, justice, and inclusion form the foundation of our collective response. My remarks today will focus specifically on how people-centered justice approaches can help societies manage the social and economic fallout from the pandemic and help build more just and equal societies. The Justice for All report by the Task Force on Justice estimates that globally 5.1 million people lack meaningful access to justice, 
While people in all countries are affected, the burden of injustice is felt more acutely by women, children, migrants, disabled and minority communities, particularly those living in poverty and inequality. The COVID-19 pandemic has also compounded the global justice gap. The public health crisis has become a human rights crisis, placing the socioeconomic rights of people at great risk. In countries engulfed in ongoing conflict, it has put human rights and other international legal protections under extra pressure. And in fact, UN Women speaks of the shadow pandemic, the dramatic increase in domestic violence as a consequence of the pandemic. The OECD economic outlook projects the global GDP will decline by 4.5% this year. And this will certainly lead to a further wave of layoffs, bankruptcies, debt, evictions, the loss of property, and an increase in disputes between businesses and consumers. The economic freefall in many countries will inevitably increase the demand for justice. The pandemic, of course, has posed significant challenges to both the formal and informal justice systems, courts of clothes, lawyers, paralegals, and other frontline justice workers have been unable to reach communities. And this is exacerbated by the digital divide, which further constrains access to information and assistance. Alongside these pitfalls, though, new opportunities for innovation and recalibration towards people-centered justice have arisen. They give us hope. A people-centered approach starts with an understanding of people's justice needs and designs solutions which empowers people to seek solutions, provides them with quality services throughout their justice journey and helps them believe that their problems will be resolved fairly. The crisis, of course, has also provided the opportunity for the innovative design and adaptability for more effective justice services, which are able to respond and meet the needs of people. It has also spurred collaboration between role players in delivering people-centered justice. Many countries are utilizing alternative dispute mechanisms, hotlines, call lines, and innovative technological solutions, including representation before virtual courts. Last Friday in my own country, South Africa, I attended a virtual appeal hearing on one of my cases in the Supreme Court of Appeals. The Justice Department in my country has also ensured that women are able to apply for a protection order online. Italian police have adapted a UPAR app originally designed to report bullying near schools to allow victims of abuse to send messages to the police without alerting their partners. Of course, we need to remember that women in developing countries are 20% less likely to own a smartphone and 20% less likely to access the internet from mobile phones other than men. And so there's an enormous amount of work to do to address the digital divide. Nevertheless, civil society across the globe has been extraordinarily innovative. For instance, the Katswe Sisterhood in Zimbabwe opened a hotline for survivors of domestic and gender-based violence as the courts were closed during the pandemic. They also trained paralegals to support survivors in rural areas to deal with their complaints. In South Sudan, where I work, South Sudanese women set up the Walk Against Rape group to provide assistance to survivors of domestic and gender-based violence. In their advocacy around prevention, they have become a force to be reckoned with on justice issues affecting women, such as property, divorce, and child custody in their engagement with policymakers. But COVID-19 has also impacted on many post-conflict societies in transition across the globe. Governments implementing transitional justice have adapted their programs in order to prevent the recurrence of human rights violations, further radicalization, and violent extremism. The government in the Gambia, for instance, 
designated a welfare fund under the victim support funds supported by the UN in order to continue to pay reparations, including interim reparations, medical and psychosocial support as well. But in concluding, we need collectively to commit to invest in justice and increase evidence-based solutions that improve justice outcomes for everyone. Justice leaders must work together globally and regionally to advance SDG 16 and provide equitable access to justice for all. It is only then that we can adequately address this crisis and build more open, transparent and accountable societies. And so the launch of the statement today is to be welcomed. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yasmin, uh, for the focus on solutions, uh, very good input, and the, the reminder to all of us that we need to invest in this and in people-centered justice. Now, I'm going to hand it over to the Excellency Magnus Lennartson. Magnus, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Excellencies, colleagues, um, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very pleased to, to deliver these remarks on behalf of uh, Swedish State Secretary Maya Fjestad, who is the co-chair of the Advisory Council to the Grand Challenge on Inequality and Exclusion, who on short notice, unfortunately, was unable to participate this morning. Let me start by expressing Sweden's support for the Pathfinders Member States statement and reiterate our commitment to multilateral action in addressing global challenges and responding to the demand of our citizens for greater ambition to build a more just, equitable, peaceful and sustainable future with Agenda 2030 at its core. Less than a year ago, most of us hadn't heard of COVID-19. Today, the outbreak has swept across the globe with major implications on all parts of our societies. For Sweden, as for other countries, the pandemic is testing the very fabric of our social safety net. The inequalities and exclusion marking the world before the pandemic have deepened, having disproportionate impact on those already vulnerable. Pre-existing inequalities also magnify the effects of the crisis those growing inequalities are a threat to our future with the risk that the global health crisis, which has already produced the economic and social crisis will become a political crisis if we don't act locally as well as globally. So common action on inequality and exclusion as well as peace and justice must be at the center of the recovery. To support this, I'm pleased to announce that several countries involved alongside Sweden in the Pathfinders Grand Challenge, Canada, Costa Rica, Ethiopia, Indonesia, Republic of Korea, Mexico, Sierra Leone, Tunisia, and Uruguay, have just recently developed a set of priority policies uh, for discussion amongst governments, multilaterals, and civil society, including on how to reduce inequality and leaving no one behind. These policies include many related to COVID-19, such as mechanisms to ensure equitable access to vaccines, community-based social protection, and dialogues to bring people together politically in inclusive discussions of their future after this immense international shock. They also include longer-term action on the future of work, building on the global deal, on building assets for youth, and on supporting inclusive social compacts. We will be working together with our partners in the multilateral systems, in the, in the multilateral system and civil society to implement some of these policies at home according to our own circumstances and take forward a common agenda in international fora. The pandemic and its consequences demonstrate the need to strengthen international collaboration and invest in partnerships. There's a growing demand for political viable, politically viable solutions to address inequalities and the root causes. And this is very much in line with the objectives of the Grand Challenge itself. Sweden is happy to support the efforts to facilitate exchanges and research aimed at reducing 
inequality and exclusion and produce evidence-based policy recommendations that can be adopted by member states. One immediate priority for the international community is the equitable and universal access to COVID-19 medical treatments and technologies. Vaccines are the most powerful public health tool and critical for saving lives. When one or more vaccine proves successful, it must be a win for all of us. It's an opportunity to decrease inequalities between states as well as citizens. International collective action will be required to ensure equal access to vaccine, regardless of nationality, gender, ethnicity, or income. A second immediate priority for collective action is to ensure that the funds dispersed for COVID-19 recovery benefit the poor and the middle class. And we're developing indicators to help societies to measure this. It is crucial for people's trust in governments around the world, which rose in the early days of COVID, but is now decreasing, that the recovery programs are transparently managed and seen to benefit those who need it most. In closing, this is the time for collaboration, solidarity, and for building back better, together and in the most inclusive way possible. We must stand up and support international principles and institutions. And the pandemic presents an opportunity to tackle systemic inequalities and achieve the central promise of the 2030 agenda to leave no one behind. And as pathfinders, we can work together and we must take this opportunity to build a better and more sustainable world. Thank you so much. Thank you, Magnus, for that uh, strong call to action and call to support multilateral collaboration and invest in policies and action to fight inequality. I'm going to hand it over to Lisa John, the Secretary General of Civicus, who will take it on. <laughs> Thank you, Liv. Uh, it, it's great to be part of this discussion, which is very, very timely, uh, considering that, uh, you know, just a month ago, most of us thought we didn't have cause for any measure of optimism as this year ended, but a few weeks down the line, there's, there seems to be a lot we can build on and, and therefore having this conversation about placing inclusion, participation and a just recovery front and center as we move into 2021 is really welcome. Uh, the statement uh, that has been released by states, but also the, the earlier statement by communities on, on, on ensuring that SDG 16 really, you know, is, is at the heart of how we uh, read and navigate uh, not just the coronavirus, but all of the complex challenges that COVID has really thrown up uh, in different parts of the world, I, I think is what uh, we really need to take forward in, in, in the coming months as well. Uh, so civic participation really, uh, I mean, from, from where I sit and, and, and the work I do is fundamental to how we address any of the complex challenges that we're talking about uh, here, but also that we, we're going to have to increasingly address as we move forward. Uh, move ahead and and whether it's inequality whether it's uh, you know social disruption and mistrust uh, whether it's the uh, inability or ability of institutions to really respond to the increasing needs and demands on the ground the absence of radical forms of participation in fact i've been really encouraged in the past few weeks i, I I'm, I'm part of the open government partnership um, steering committee and to hear proposals coming in from subnational and national governments that now not just talk about participation, but co-creation with citizens. I think that's, that's the model that we need to be, uh, you know, kind of picking up now and, and building further towards. So, to, um, I mean, uh, again, when you look at uh, the whole of last year, you know, when we ended in December 2019, the world was in a state of uprising. There were protests and there were street demonstrations, there were movements, social movements being activated across the world in any region, irrespective of the state uh, of civic uh, freedoms, uh, you know, in, in, in that part of the world or the country. And I think this was a, a really fundamental call uh, for people to be part of the policies that are being created, uh, you know, for them and around them, for people to be part of championing the causes that they want to see, but also to represent their direct lived experience of exclusion, of inequality, uh, you know, in, in these in, in conversations. And, and I think that's a call, not just for governments, but also for civil society. More and more, 
I think this year has really taught us that we need to be ultimately accountable to the communities we serve and, and ensuring the leadership and visibility of communities who have the lived experience of the challenges we're facing is going to be fundamental to building that kind of legitimacy and sustainable solutions uh, you know, going forward. So having said that, uh, you know, we, we were already in a state where in 2019, we knew that 40% of the world's population lived in, lives in repressed contexts. Uh, only 3% of the world's population actually enjoys their fundamental civic freedoms, which is the right to expression, assembly and association. And yet across 2020, we've seen governments use uh, the pandemic as, a, as an excuse to disproportionately uh, implement emergency measures. So in fact, censorship has increased exponentially attacks on human rights defenders and civil society has increased, uh, you know, I mean, across, uh, across levels and across the board. Uh, and in addition to that, we are also grappling with the increased, I mean, the additional uh, complexity of increased surveillance uh, and, uh, you know, the, the undermining uh, of uh, mechanisms for democratic oversight. So all of the elections that have happened this year, um, many of them, uh, there's been deliberate attempts to kind of ensure that people aren't able to vote you know, properly or, or, or there's been attempts to actually stagger or delay them uh, by those in power. And, and I think uh, at the end of the year, you know, what, what we've been really uh, taking forward and feeling hopeful about is that people across the world have realized that without their direct participation, we can't expect our institutions to serve us better. So we are no longer going to be relying on governments and other institutions to just tell us what needs to be done. Everybody, no matter where they are, what class, what race, what background, feels the need to be part of that process, to, to be you know, holding uh, both state and non-state actors accountable. And to end, I'm going to say that there are two kind of fundamental truths that we need to be taking forward uh, from this conversation. One is this is the age of people power. You may be the, you know, the biggest dictatorship in, this, in the world, but you're not going to be able to hold people back. People are going to find a way to get around internet shutdowns, to get around repression, to get around attacks. In even the most restricted and closed societies in the world, we are seeing people organize innovatively and, and fight back. And, and that's just going to be something that governments are going to have to deal with. Governments need more feminist leadership approaches. Governments need to be embracing criticism. Uh, they need to be knowing how to work better with new social movements because new social movements are not going away. Uh, so I think it's, it's just in the interest of both parties to, to start understanding each other and make, you know, this, this, the social contract, make the, 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 the whole process of governance work better. Uh, and, and linked to that is the fact that the open governance approach cannot be an af afterthought. The need for us to really organize around values, I mean, for governments to organize around values of transparency, inclusion, and participation is going to be, you know, fundamental to their own survival. Uh, and I've, uh, again, it's been very encouraging to see, you know, at the national level, countries like Spain, but at subnational levels, uh, you know, pilot pro projects uh, and, and, and programs in Kenya and Afghanistan, you know, in, in, in very many parts of the world, uh, really seeing leadership emerge uh, at the local level, seeing the need that uh, local leaders now are, are really communicating and expressing for a better relationship with the constituencies they serve and a more equal partnership with people. Uh, so I think that hierarchy that we kind of grew up with many of us of our generation where, where somebody would tell us what's good for us and we would follow, that no longer exists. And I think the more we can embrace that and, and take that forward and find new ways, uh, you know, to really co-create our, uh, you know, the new solutions we need, uh, the better, uh, you know, the uh, future will look for all of us. Uh, I'll end there. Thank you very much, Lisa, for that call for accountability, solidarity, leadership, and not the least uh, action. Um, I'm going to hand it over to here to, to Celia Ouellet to hear the business perspective on peace, justice, and inclusion. Uh, please, Celia Ouellet from the Responsible Business Initiative for Justice. The screen is yours. Thank you so much, Liv, and good morning, everybody. Um, thank you very much to the team at Pathfinders for, for inviting me to speak at this event. I'm very honored to be here and very inspired by the words of my fellow panelists, so thank you. Um, 
our work, uh, the work of the Responsible Business Initiative for Justice is, is, to, is to build support for campaigners, uh, for activists, for organizers, and uh, those seeking to change, uh, create change in systems of justice. Um, we seek to bring powerful allies to the table and to, and to shift the power dynamic that has for so long created uh, inequality and unfairness and frankly, ineffectiveness in, uh, in systems of justice. And those powerful allies that we work with, that we bring to the table are of course, uh, businesses. Um, you know, businesses being instrumental in ending hate and suffering and discrimination is, is not theoretical or anything new. When Coca-Cola announced its intention to withdraw from apartheid South Africa, you know, they struck a major blow for systemic racial inequality in the region. And corporations have that same op opportunity now, um, you know, for us, for all of us, of course, this year has been a very turbulent one, but it is one in which the problems in justice systems have come into particularly um, sharp focus, especially in America. Um, and the purpose and the value of SDG 16, which of course calls for fair systems of justice, has perhaps never been more relevant. Um, and the goals are clear, for our, go our goals are clear. We must end human rights violations in systems of justice we must end extrajudicial uh, killing, uh, for example, by police officers. We must end extreme punishment like the death penalty and juvenile life without possibility of parole. We need the rule of law to be observed. We can't have systems of justice uh, that don't allow for the correction of error. For example, right now in Tennessee, in the American state of Tennessee, there's a man on death row um, who is intellectually disabled, something that is uh, forbidden by law uh, for a person with intellectual disability to be executed, but he's technically pre present, uh, prevented from, um, from asking for a relief from execution on that basis because he's um, technically uh, cannot go back in time and, and correct his legal paperwork. So we must change. And our systems of justice and punishment must change. Um, and we, we must be conduits for that change. We must be catalysts for that change. Um, and we must seek and find and create opportunities for change uh, wherever we can and whenever we can. You know, I am a firm believer that that multi-stakeholder platforms are, are the best way to create change. When governments, the private sector and civil society organizations join forces, you know, the opportunity for impact widens. And that's something that I've, I've literally seen firsthand. Um, and while progress on goal 16 has been okay for governments and civil society, I think significantly less focus has been pla uh, placed on the role of the private sector in, a, in advancing that goal. Um, I reflect on the UN Global Compact's 2018 progress report that, that showed that only 28% of companies uh, responded any activities on SDG uh, 16. And this is something that, that we at RBIJ, and we hope that you uh, will, will work on and, and change you know, why? Because we know that businesses have power and leverage and platforms that command large and influential audiences. You know, this, this was the notion, this is the theory of change that our organization was quite literally build, built upon, that the, the campaign community knew that businesses were essential players to help shift the needle and lift up their voices. Um, and while it's true historically that many companies have kind of shied away from issues like justice, or, or perhaps more fair is to say they've been unsure of what they can do and what their role is. Um, but I think that this year, the recent police killings, the subsequent protests and the following spotlight that has been placed on problems in justice systems has seen a huge change towards business attitudes on the topic of justice. And now they understand that they must be answering questions like what is our role? and how can we be conduits and catalysts and champions uh, for something better and fairer um, and that doesn't contain racism or, or discrimination or human rights violations. And it is now critical that businesses take a stand and be on the right side of history. Um, it is expected of them, you know, polling, studies, cancel culture are clear kind of pieces of evidence that point to this being true. So we, all 117 of us, and uh, those within our network have an opportunity. 
as champions for SDG 16, we now need to work harder than ever to kind of bring all the stakeholders to the table. And businesses are in need of a greater presence at their table and a greater visibility at the table. And it's also critical that we ask them to make their stands on these issues impactful, that they go beyond one-off press statements and instead engaged in you know, targeted and sustained and repeated advocacy to deliver change. You know, it's critical that we have businesses in this with us for the long term, rather than just posting a black tile on a social media profile. Um, and it's critical that businesses create uh, self-reporting obligations or governments impose reporting obligations and accountability measures to show how they are contributing to change. And it's critical that businesses listen and learn from those uh, who have lived experience of the justice system. Mm. And we want to make that easy. I think, you know, don't get stuck at um, this sounds great in theory, but we don't know how to do it. You know, we have published toolkits. We work one on one with businesses to make sure that you have um, that education from justice involved community members. And I think that goes to prove that civil society organizations can be the map and compass if you let them be and if you commit to that partnership. And I'm going to close by saying, you know, these steps can make all the difference and can break down some of the structural barriers and, and encourage peace and justice and inclusion. You know, what the statement being launched by Pathfinder today is, is really all about. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Celia. These steps can indeed make all the difference. Uh, with those words, I pass it on to Nicolas from Wufuna, who is going to talk about the broader SDG 16 plus community statement. Please, Nicolas, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Liv, and uh, for the kind introduction, and thank you to the whole Pathfinders team and, and core organizers for inviting me to speak on this important and timely panel alongside such distinguished guests and panelists um, about the importance of investing in and prioritizing SG 16 plus implementation in our response efforts as we continue to combat and recover from the ongoing pandemic. It really is an honor to be here with you all. Um, as as Liv said, my name is Nicholas Astier and I'm the SG 16 plus associate at the World Federation of UN Associations or WAFUNA. Um, and as some of you know, WAFUNA is the Secretariat of the 16 Plus Forum, which is a civil society member state led SG 16 Plus initiative, working to further SG 16 Plus implementation at all levels and across a variety of sectors. Excellencies, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to highlight today the importance of strong partnerships in achieving the 2030 agenda as a whole and SG 16 Plus in particular. Truly achieving and addressing the breadth of SG 16 Plus cannot be done by individual states or organizations alone. In order to successfully implement all SG 16 plus targets, a whole of government approach is not sufficient. Rather, a whole of society approach that truly leaves no one behind must be adopted and strengthened through multi-stakeholder and multi-sector partnerships. This is how we approach our work at WAFUNA and the 16 plus forum. WAFUNA is a civil society organization, and while the 16 plus forum is a partnership of 12 member states and the G7 plus, we work extensively with other civil society organizations, as well as with UN entities and private corporations academic institutions, and other member states and intergovernmental organizations that are not part of the 16 plus forum. Achieving peaceful, just, and inclusive societies is not an easy feat. And partnerships such as the SG 16 plus community of which we are proud members can help us come together and collaborate in order to address challenges and issues in a more efficient manner. With work being done by individuals, communities, and organizations around the world, this global movement for SG 16 plus can truly help consolidate our efforts guide implementation and drive meaningful action and progress for peace, justice and inclusion at all levels. The community, which is an informal grouping composed of a number of member states, civil society organizations and UN entities represents a wide range of actors and countries which are all focused on increasing awareness of, advocating for and accelerating progress on SG 16 plus. Partnerships such as the SG 16 plus community facilitate support, engagement and collaboration. And by pulling our collective knowledge, experience, expertise, and resources together, we can achieve greater progress and maximize our reach and influence. With so many actors working on SG16+, partnerships and collaboration also help us ensure that we avoid any duplication of work and really streamline our efforts to achieve peaceful, just, and inclusive societies for all. In our experience, partnerships have also been critical in linking local actions to global processes. 
Partnerships are more important now than ever given the crises we are facing. And we need to actively support each other in, our, in order to overcome this pandemic. Global cooperation is desperately needed as we continue our collective fight against the pandemic and further our recovery efforts. As members of the SG16 Plus community, we firmly believe that these efforts should be centered around SG16 Plus as expressed in our joint call to action that was launched a few months ago. As some of you may know, and as was referenced by other panelists, a few members of the SG16 Plus community launched a joint call to action in July during an HLPF side event. The statement, which was led by civil society organizations with input from a variety of actors, including the UN system and government representatives, has been open for endorsements since July and over 100 organizations from more than 40 countries have signed on to it. I would like to thank the Pathfinders who have since updated the statement to include the list of endorsers. And I'm pleased to announce that this new version is being launched today and can be accessed online via Twitter. This call to action was born from the SG16 Plus community's collective acknowledgement of the need to make SG16 Plus the foundation for reset and recovery efforts. SG16 Plus implementation was backsliding prior to the pandemic with growing inequalities, weak and failing institutions, an increase in violence and violence related deaths and a lack of justice continuing to plague societies around the world. COVID-19 has highlighted and exacerbated these issues and has naturally shifted attention to combating the health crisis. Given the ensuing allocation of funds and resources to the recovery, there is a very real concern that we will simply not be able to achieve all SG16 plus targets by 2030. However, it is not just a question of advancing SG16 plus implementation. We firmly believe that the SG16 plus framework can and should guide us as we respond to and eventually recover from this pandemic. The pandemic is first and foremost a health crisis. However, it has also caused a growing economic crisis coupled with political, social, and cultural dislocations around the world. All of these crises are interlinked and many of the issues at the heart of each crisis are captured within SG16+, making it the framework most suited to help us recover from the situation. While it has worsened many of these issues and exacerbated the crisis we are already facing, by highlighting systemic injustices and inequalities that have been present for decades, this pandemic has also given us the opportunity to comprehensively tackle these challenges by ensuring that we leave no one behind in our recovery. As such, we as a community believe it is time to act now for SG16+, Plus, and we thank all of you who have endorsed the call to action and all individuals, communities, organizations, and nations that are committed to furthering SG16 Plus implementation at all levels. In addition to this civil society-led call to action, we are very happy to hear that a group of member states, together with the Pathfinders, have launched today a joint statement on SG16+. Plus. This statement will effectively complement our call to action, as the two statements together include all major SG16 Plus stakeholders with non-state actors outlining actions that will be taken in the recovery from the pandemic and member states reaffirming their commitment to SG16+. We are thrilled that Costa Rica is the pen holder for this statement, and it is a pleasure to be on this panel alongside Her Excellency Ambassador Chan Valverde. This has, been, this has very much solidified their leadership in the SG16 Plus space, as they will also be hosting the fourth annual showcase in San Jose next April. And speaking of the showcase, I'd like to conclude by reminding everyone here today that the 16 plus forum Costa Rica showcase will be held from 26th to 29th of April, 2021 in San Jose and echo ambassador Chan Valverde's an <coughs> invitation, excuse me, to everyone here to attend the conference in April. Unfortunately, while the showcase was scheduled to take place in December, we have had to postpone it because of the pandemic. We hope that the global situation will have improved greatly by the end of April and that we will be able to hold the conference as planned. However, we are also looking into the possibility of having all showcase sessions in April streamed live so that those who are unable to make it or prefer not to travel can still participate and everyone can be included. We will also be holding a few virtual sessions in January in collaboration with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Costa Rica in the lead up to, this, to the conference in the spring. And I'm happy to answer any questions that anyone may have regarding the showcase during the Q&A, or if you would like, please feel free to reach out to me and I will add my informa contact information in the chat box. Thank you very much and back to you, Lee. Thank you very much, Nicolas. Now is the time to hear from Vevin Muganda, and I leave the floor or screen to you, please. Thank you so much um, for the invitation today. Um, I'm from Mombasa, Kenya. I'm a human rights activist, and I'll just like to talk about um, the agency in participation of young people in um, in recovery efforts for COVID-19. Um, at the beginning of the pandemic, we 
we were not aware of what was going on. I can speak for um, my country where every regulation that was put in place was a trial and error method. And so um, I took the initiative to co-found an initiative that's called Mutual Aid Kenya. And it's a youth-led initiative that's driven by the community, funded by the community. And so every uh, dollar and money we received was given to us by the community to support the needs of those who are highly affected. And uh, when we look at uh, the report by um, the UN75 report, the need for solidarity and, and um, young people reiter reiterated that global solidarity is one of the key points that the UN should focus on moving forward in the future that we want. And um, we can see how much it comes up when we look at the movements and the protests that have been held during this pandemic from the US with the Black Lives Matter to Nigeria with the NSAs to Kenya with the end police brutality. And we are seeing that young people were organizing, they're using open governance system, they were using accountability systems. Uh, for sure, there's so much that institutions and especially governments can learn in how young people are currently organizing to address the needs of the community during this pandemic. Um, uh, of course, the need to partner with young people at the grassroots level as well as uh, across all other levels in uh, achieving SDG 16 and also as a good opportunity for, for the SDG 16 plus forum. Uh, just to also mention that uh, last year I was selected to be part of UNDP's uh, 16 by 16 initiative and it's uh, we're 16 activists from different countries and uh, what UNDP did is facilitate our participation in global decision making processes. So for instance, I was able to um, talk about how young people in Mombasa are participating in peace and security efforts at the Security Council last year. And even during this pandemic, I have seen how this initiative has gone just beyond um, SDG 16 and peace and security to now addressing the health crisis, that is the, um, the pandemic. And just looking at how young people are organizing right now, there's a lot of uh, donor fatigue, there's a lot of um, challenges such as in physical organizing. Uh, just to give an example of Mutual Aid Kenya, um, we had a network of about 100 uh, plus volunteers. We had initially never met. We were coordinating all our movements online um, from crowdfunding to shopping for the relief food. We were providing relief food, um, education materials to children who cannot access e-learning, providing medical supplies, and even running errands for high-risk populations. But most importantly was our participation in the formulation of the COVID-19 um, bill in Kenya, the Pandemic Response Management Bill. And this is what has really uh, increased, um, or rather, um, helped the government to understand why it's important for young people to participate. We keep saying that there's nothing for us without us, but um, it really comes out strongly when at a time like this during a pandemic, young people are at the front lines of addressing community needs and all that. And so just to conclude is that more than ever right now, we are facing the greatest injustice of our time. Uh, so many of my peers, this is our first pandemic. This is the first of any, I think this for us is like the biggest crisis ever. And so there's really a need to one align to the priorities and needs of young people from all over the world, but also more importantly to partner and support young people initiatives in uh, not only SDG 16, but also in other uh, socioeconomic elements that could lead to development in general. Thank you so much, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak today. Wow, thank you very much, Vevin. Uh, I think uh, we have definitely become convinced that uh, we're not gonna manage this recovery without youth uh, on the front line. Um, now I have the pleasure of handing it over to Her Excellency Joka Brandt, the permanent representative of the Netherlands to the United Nations, who is going to come with some closing remarks. Please, this screen is yours. 
Well, well, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Liv, and uh, uh, thank you also to you and, and all friends uh, at Pathfinders for organizing this event. And of course, a big thank you to uh, all the panelists. Uh, all of you are real champions uh, for uh, SDG 16, and I found it really inspiring, you know, to hear these really impressive examples from government representatives, businesses, and so, uh, civil society about um, um, already what is already being done uh, globally and a specific thank you to Wevin for again you know pointing out to us uh, the importance of, of partnering with and supporting uh, uh, young uh, uh, young people's initiatives. I think all of this really illustrates what we've been talking about the importance of advancing peace justice and inclusion in COVID-19 responses and, and recovery, because I think from all, the, uh, from all the contributions by the panelists, it's clear uh, that COVID-19 has caused large scale loss of life and human suffering globally. It generated a major economic and social crisis and, and basically touch uh, ever, uh, every aspect uh, uh, of life. Uh, this slowing economy, job losses, insecurity, non-existing or inadequate uh, safety nets, all of these are expected to push more than 100 million additional people into extreme poverty globally, uh, according to the recent forecasts by a study commissioned uh, by UNDP and UN Women. And so the pandemic has really painfully laid bare the inequalities and injustices in our society, vulnerable and disadvantaged groups are impacted more uh, severely. And as you also said, Liz, even before COVID, we were facing huge challenges of inequality and inclusion. But now those who were already behind risk falling uh, behind even further, and those that were previously barely keeping up now join the group that is falling behind. And uh, specifically, women and girls are put at risk uh, by this pandemic. Several of you have spoken about it. They risk losing their access to education, uh, to jobs, because women are very often employed in the informal economy. And sadly, we've also seen that lockdowns and the pandemic have com contributed to increased uh, domestic violence and, and partner uh, abuse. And I think it was Jasmine who said, you know, that the health crisis now threatens to become, or already is, a human, uh, a human rights uh, crisis. There is a, a big need for more and better access to justice while uh, institutions uh, are weakened and cannot cope, thereby compounding uh, the justice gap. So um, rapid action to ensure that the most vulnerable have the necessary access to legal support is urgently required because failure to do so would further deepen existing inequalities, create new divides and cause disruptions in society. So um, let me just say that for me, this meeting is very timely. The launch of the statement is timely and also very much welcome, of course, the call um, to action. And let's hope that uh, more organizations and countries are going to endorse those. The Netherlands is surely proud to be among the Pathfinders countries and to collectively work on access to justice for all, for peaceful and inclusive societies, because it's clear that any pathway for recovery from this COVID crisis must have accessible and people-centered justice systems as a core pillar to uh, equitable, uh, equitably restore economies, rebuild social cohesion and heal communities. So there's work to do, um, but let us also um, uh, realize uh, that the pandemic pandemic can also be a disruptor that gives rise to new opportunities, uh, opportunities to push for collective action. And we can use this moment to transform justice systems to respond to the changing needs of people, societies and communities. And I'm really uh, encouraged by uh, the many examples that a number of speakers gave about, you know, what, uh, how this is already happening and how we can uh, all be a catalyst uh, for uh, change. So um, let's use this chance for innovation and for a new way of do doing uh, things, a way that is more people-centered in uh, nature. Let's work together at implementing the agenda laid out by the Justice for All report at the 
local, national, regional and global uh, level. And let's work uh, across the different agendas for peace, justice and inclusion towards our common uh, goals. And as the Minister of Afgan Afghanistan just said, it doesn't matter where we are. We share uh, the same uh, agenda, the same goals. We can use the same international uh, tools. And uh, of course, partnering together on this remains crucial. So we know uh, what to do. What we now need, I think, is concerted action and leadership. So let me also take this opportunity to call on others to join us in this effort, because in conclusion, SDC 6, SDG 16 is a universal goal, not a side activity. And we cannot afford to miss out on the opportunity to make that a central element of our efforts to build back better. Now, more than ever, peace, justice and inclusion are vital to ensure we reach the 2030 agenda, uh, agenda objective to leave no one behind. Um, together we can do it, and I feel that with this meeting, we've really made an important step towards that common objective. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joka, both for excellent concluding remarks. The leadership Netherlands is, is giving on peace, justice and inclusion, and not the least in the leadership position of the global justice movement, uh, focusing on people-centered justice. Now, you talked about concerted action. We've got limited time left, but I'd like to give a couple of minutes to actually the Minister Hasina Safi from Afghanistan. You talked about unity before, and there's one question in the chat box about unity of developed and developing countries and how we can assure that we manage to unite developing and developed countries in the efforts for the implementation of the SDGs. Now, how should we go forward building a unity movement in order to accelerate action on the SDGs? Hasina Safi, Minister, please. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity again. Uh, I think we have already uh, built uh, uh, platforms like as of such that we are all connecting in the issues uh, and sharing uh, in talking and finding. Mm. Uh, the second thing is, I think uh, the best way based on my experience is that uh, we uh, think of uh, the developing and develop, uh, underdevelopment countries, we think of them as partners. We don't think uh, that because because they are an underdevelopment country, uh, so they do not uh, have uh, resources or they are not resources. So uh, the basic, I think one of the fundamental uh, points which I would like to mention here is uh, the confidence uh, on the experience which they bring from the ground. And uh, the confidence uh, which they uh, have are uh, the initiatives, the local initiatives, uh, because that is a history which has come all along with them. And definitely, uh, as we are all human, so we all have local initiatives which have been a part of our uh, success. Uh, that is one of the things uh, which I would um, uh, emphasize. The third uh, thing is that uh, still we all need uh, to measure uh, the initiative so far. Uh, do we need to create or to establish new initiatives? Uh, because if we start something and when leave it, we leave it in the middle and then we start another initiative, so what will happen to the one which we started earlier? 
And so I would suggest the way we are all the time uh, talking that we have less time, we have to be efficient, we have to be concise, we have to be brief. So the same thing is with all the international tools as well. The more we are concise, brief, uh, and the more we are combined, so to share with each other and to plan programs globally and universally. First thing is think of the underdevelopment countries as partners. The second thing is uh, building on local initiatives in order to be cost effective. And the third thing is rather than um, starting new initiatives, we should combine them in order to be very easily, easily measurable and be more effective. Thank you so much. Uh, you, I think we're struggling a little bit with the, the, the line to Afghanistan, but we, we got the main points, Your Excellency, and they were very much welcome. Now we only have two, three minutes left, so I'm afraid we are running out of time for others to, to jump in. I want to respect the time of the panelists and the time of the, the participants, but uh, you will find more information on our website, on social media, you will find the statements being circulated. They've been circulated in the chat box and they will also be found on social media and our website. So I'd like to actually wrap up, um, thank everyone for joining in and in particular, the excellent panelists for very precise comments as well as very strong calls to actions. I'd like to thank Costa Rica and the Netherlands in particular for hosting this event and then just concluding by reiterating, repeating the same call to action that many others have given before me. Uh, it's coming very strongly here through the statement, through the speakers from 38 governments, more than 100 organizations from the business side, from civil society, as well as government representatives. A call for action, a call to focus on peace, justice, and inclusion, and a united response as such. Uh, we need to start rebuilding and responding with the right perspective, a perspective and a lens of SDG 16 plus basically. We hope you all help taking that call to action out to the broader public so that recovery and the reset and the response is done in order to minimize the spillover effects and problems we fear are coming. Thank you all. Thanks for joining and have a nice day.